Assalamu alaikum and good evening everyone. On behalf of the Academy of Law and Policy in short Allah, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all to our second legal webinar. And this particular webinar is on virtual courts, challenges and prospects. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought the entire planet to a standstill. We have not come across such an extraordinary situation in our lifetimes. Since the 29th of March, 2020, the date set for the reopening of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh and the other courts, Bangladesh witnessed an unprecedented lockdown on justice. In view of the raging COVID pandemic, it was impossible to resume regular court operations. The role of the judiciary as parents patrie of each and every citizen cannot be emphasized enough. Therefore, the importance of having functional courts need no elaboration. Some device or some system had to be carved out to make the courts functional again, even if in a limited capacity, without compromising the health and safety of lawyers, judges, court officials, and litigants. In a historic move, viewers, the third organ of the state, the guardians of the constitution, the Bangladeshi judiciary, responded to this situation by rolling out virtual courts on the 10th of May, 2020, and unlocking justice when the nation needed it most. The Supreme Court's Special Committee for Judicial Reforms, under the dynamic leadership of Mr. Justice Mohammad Iman Ali, in collaboration with UNDP Bangladesh and a technical team from A to I made it all happen. A snapshot for all of you of the work that virtual courts have done till date, some of the work. One, the child development centers in Bangladesh housed around 1140 children under trial for mostly petty crimes. The capacity of these centers is only for 600. So you can imagine the state of congestion and uh, how understaffed these centers are, and that children ran the high risk, if not inevitability, of being infected. Since virtual courts started, 343 children were released from custody in a span of around seven working days. The second thing that this virtual courts has done is 27,480 persons were released in bail between the 10th of May and the 4th of June. Viewers, we're honored and privileged to have with us today two of the key players in this journey of virtual courts in Bangladesh, Mr. Justice Mohammad Iman Ali, Honorable Judge of the Appellate Division of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. He's also the Chairman of the Special Committee for Judicial Reforms and the Special Committee for Child Rights. So we'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. Thank you, Rashna. If I may start. Sir, if I may quickly introduce our second guest. Um, okay. Our Thank second you. guest today is Ms. Van Guen, Deputy Resident Representative of UNDP Bangladesh. Hello, Van. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, viewers, uh, let us, uh, without wasting any further time, uh, start with the webinar. My first question to you, sir, uh, would be, was it at all possible uh, to resume court operations, regular court operations, once the pandemic started in Bangladesh? I mean, we all know that uh, Regular court operations would mean mitigation and containment measures in place, would mean awareness amongst all the court attendees of a certain level of public and personal hygiene. So given all of that, in your view, was it at all possible? Well, very simple question to that is no. But let me start, uh, first of all, by thanking Alap for organizing this talk on virtual hearings. Uh, what I would like to add is that um, we should call it perhaps virtual hearings and digital courts, because essentially that is what we are leading up to. And I will explain to you in a moment why I say this. But 
if I may at the very outset, um, quote what the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina said in a meeting, in a virtual meeting on 4th of June of this year, uh, when she said, coronavirus mohammadir bistar thekate jokon manusher sangsporsho eriye cholatai mukho shei shomoye totto projuktir agrogotir karone bangladesher jonogon ghore boshei odhikangsho kaj korte parche awami league sarkar tar digital bangladesher shopnoke bastobe rup dewar karonei eta shombhob hoyeche i would like to just add to this that because of digitalization we have been able to provide some service to the people of this country, the litigants. As you have said, the uh, Center for Child uh, Development, the De Child Development Centers were highly overcrowded. There were 1,140 children in a space of 600. And we managed to get uh, more than 300 at that time within a space of about seven days. But I can tell you now that more 421 children, according to my last uh, records have been released from those development centers. Now, as you know, in March 2020, many countries of the world were under lockdown due to coronavirus pandemic, and Bangladesh lockdown was put into effect by what was called public holiday. That was declared on the 26th of March and extended several times until the 30th of May. At the same time, elsewhere in the world, Supreme Courts paved the way for virtual hearings. As you know, the UK uh, enacted the Coronavirus Act of 2020. In India, the Supreme Court had a sewer motor rule issued, and they then, in that rule, ordered for virtual hearings to take place. But unfortunately, Bangladesh was on holiday, and there was no parliament to pass any law and the Supreme Court was not sitting, so we could not issue any rule. So we looked to find a solution, so justice would, be, could, would not be stalled, and ultimately the Supreme Court Judicial Reforms Committee endeavored with the intervention and approval of, from the highest level to have the virtual hearings. As a result of our trial uh, tries, the ordinance was passed called the Adalot Kotti Tottopojukti Bebohar Oddadesh Bihadar Bish. And that was passed on the 9th of May 2020, allowing our courts to have virtual hearings. Now, initially, the Honorable Chief Justice allowed only bail matters to be heard by video conference. And later, urgent matters were allowed to be heard both by the district judiciary and the Supreme Court. The result, of course, speaks for itself. In this Space of 10 working days, 33,287 bail applications were moved and 20,938 persons were released in the space of only 10 days. And as I said, the 343 children were released from the child development centers in the space of seven working days. Now, I believe that was a huge achievement. And thanks to the support of my colleagues in the committee, UNDP, A2I, who helped us with uh, the technology, UNICEF in Bangladesh, who helped us with the children's cases. And if you can imagine all these people in the very short space of time worked tirelessly, I think day and night, because one of them was in fact working from Japan. So when we were during our evening time, he was working during his deep into the night time, which was very commendable. I, I appreciate all of the people who worked so hard tirelessly and hard. Now, a very close relative of mine, who is a lawyer of the Supreme Court, was complaining that uh, I was not allowing physical courts to operate. Of course, it was not my decision. The Supreme Court does not operate by my order. The Honorable Chief Justice, who has the prerogative to allow courts to, to perform or which courts to perform, when to perform, that is entirely within his jurisdiction. I have no say in that at all. But what was happening was that suddenly we saw the courts were not functioning at all. And that was leaving people basically without justice. So um, the Supreme Court went into action. And I take pride 
from the fact that the Supreme Court has enabled the functioning of courts, though in a very limited way, otherwise we would still be enjoying a holiday, as was declared by the government. Now, today, I'm happy to tell you that my relative who was com complaining that he could not operate the system, he was not tech savvy enough to even operate a smartphone. Today, I see, I heard, I, in fact, I looked it up later on in somebody else's phone. I don't use Facebook. So I heard in the Facebook that he had posted the fact that he got 100% relief in a big criminal case that he had moved virtually before the High Court Division. So all I can say is that the swift, bold, and pragmatic response enabled the Supreme Court to act urgently to reduce the prison population and the population of the child development centers. And I'm grateful to all concerned, in particular, the Honorable Chief Justice for his spontaneous support and continuing cooperation of all my colleagues. We are now working towards enabling the system to accommodate urgent applications in the civil matters also, including injunction, injunctions. Now, at this stage, I have to make it clear that the virtual hearings that we have tried to set up is a byproduct of the worldwide attack of COVID-19. And full-fledged virtual hearings, as we see them, is only a temporary measure. Because when the courts are functioning fully, then there's no question of having virtual hearings. It's not necessary, because otherwise the court would become redundant. So when the regular court is there, virtual court will not be there. But will the virtual hearings at all continue in any form? And the answer to that is yes. Virtual courts are are operating now because, as I said earlier, I believe human life matters, including those of our court sweepers and their families. And who would take the responsibility should anything happen to any of the court staff who expose themselves because we have opened up the courts? I, I fully appreciate the action taken by the Honorable Chief Justice to um, allow the virtual court hearings to go ahead rather than physical court hearings. Now, when the virtual courts do not exist anymore, because virtual courts will not be necessary when the open courts are there, full physical open courts are there, we will still have the necessity, if we choose to have it, to have semi-virtual, if I can put it that way, semi-virtual uh, um, court hearings where many things can be done with the use of IT equipment and technology. For example, deposition of witnesses could be done by video conference, especially which, where witness and victim protection is in question. So witnesses can give evidence from a remote place. Um, witnesses who are beyond the jurisdiction, for example, training or studying abroad, or who have been posted elsewhere other than the place where they are supposed to be giving uh, evidence as a witness. What happens at the moment is that long delays take place simply because, for example, the investigating officer has been posted elsewhere and therefore can't be reached or can't make time to come over to the court to give evidence. So also witnesses who are unable to travel to the court because of various ailments um, and the time and expense involved in having their evidence taken on commission. This can be avoided if the semi-virtual court, as I call it, can take place. Um, high security prisoners need not be called to the court physically. They can arrive, uh, they can be present in the court virtually. They can see that the court is proceeding and he can also, uh, the court can also see his demeanor, his where, from wherever he may be standing. And I, I may add that some years ago, the Honorable Prime Minister actually said when there was, I think, JMB trials were going on and the the accused could not be produced in court and the trials could not go ahead. And I think she said that why couldn't we not have a system where the prisoner doesn't have to appear physically in court? And I'm pleased to say that that can be available and that can be easily done if we have the semi-virtual courts, as I call them, in operation. The children in conflict with the law, they may be on bail. They can't appear or they shouldn't have to appear in court. We try to keep them away from the court system as far as possible. Now, these their proceedings can in fact go ahead. The whole trial can go ahead 
without their being present in court, uh, presence in court, and the probation officer can arrange for their virtual appearance in court. Now, we have no intention to make physical court structure redundant. And on the contrary, we want to just improve it. And we want to use the technology that is available to improve the situation. As far as the trials are concerned, when the regular court sits, and the only time virtual court might be organized is when there is need for steps to be taken, when there is actually no evidence or any physical handling of documents or other evidence in court. So these procedures can be handled virtually by the lawyer in his chamber, by the judge in his chamber. That would save time and, of course, cost on the part of the lawyer. The lawyer may, may deal with the uh, other mundane matters um, from his chamber. So this is good, I think. It saves time, saves money. But then it's not attractive for some lawyers, unfortunately, um, because they think that their physical appearance in court justifies their fees. So they would prefer to be physically present and show their uh, acumen <laughs> and antics in the courtroom. Um, what we sir, sir if I may... Uh, so, uh, we want to cover the prospects of uh, virtual courts in detail, actually, towards uh, the end of our webinar, uh, especially whether it is, as you've already stated, whether it is here to stay in, even if in a limited capacity, or is this just a stopgap measure? So we want to, we want to hear from you a bit more on that, sir, uh, on the prospects. If I may uh, now uh, ask Miss. Van Duen to enlighten us about uh, UNDP's role uh, in this. How, how, what was UNDP's role from the very beginning? Okay, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Rasna. Uh, I actually enjoy so much listening to um, Justice Iman Ali. You know, it's like a, a story telling. He is very good at. Uh, telling story. Um, I really look uh, back and remember the what I would call a historical day on the 7th of May. And uh, for, for me, the way I remember the, the dates, those days, is that I try to put those dates in something that is easy for me to remember. So 7th of May is actually the day that I am from Vietnam, and so Vietnam on that day was defeating French. So it's Viet Bien Phu, uh, famous Viet Bien Phu battle. So that's the 7th of May, uh, when, the, when the ordinance was uh, promulgated. And then on the 9th of May, when the, the ordinance was approved by Honorable Prime Minister, the 9th of May is uh, the Europe Day, the Victory Day. So I remember those days very much. I also remember one thing, one of the very first virtual calls um, hearing is to save or to stop people from killing dolphin. So, so I love that. You know? Now, let's get back to your question. First of all, I would like to say that um, UNDP has been very privileged to have a very long, uh, long-term partnership with the government of Bangladesh, but it also, in particular, in this case, with the Supreme Court, and of course, you know, um, Justice Iman Ali was our very close stakeholder partner. We enjoy working with him very much, and. Uh, especially in the area of areas of judicial reforms. So last year when we discussed them with him about uh, what areas of reform that we would be supporting, we talk about the backlog, case, case backlog, 3.8 or 3.4 million, I can't remember, uh, of cases that need to be solved. So we work with, an, I was very new to Bangladesh, and that was the first time that I learned about the work of our UNDP colleagues together with the colleagues of, of with the Supreme Court. Now, 
then, then when the COVID happened, uh, we have been approached by the by the Supreme Court to support, and of course, with the partnership, we are immediately uh, trying our best. So, if the government was able to move that fast, we also have to be able to do the same. So, a lot of things. My colleagues have been working day and night, um, and under the leadership of our board, um, Mr. Sudipto Mukeshi, who's uh, the UNDP resident representative, when he met with the Chief Justice, he was saying that we would do anything possible to support you. So this is our, how our journey started. And of course, UNDP will not be able to do much without the leadership of the, just, of the Supreme Court of uh, Justice in Manali. So we have been able only to support very little on the technical side, trying to set up things that, um, that can start, uh, that, that can operationalize the virtual court. Uh, I would say that our effort, um, our support is very limited compared to what the government has been doing. But we are very proud that we are with you at that very critical moment. Uh, Van, if I may, what about training? Because UNDP is actually giving a lot of training sessions to uh, judges as well as other court officials. If you may tell us a little bit more about uh, these training programs uh, that are currently in place. Yes, so on the training, because when you, when you start up with the virtual court, virtual court is, um, is a very... To some people, it's very simple, but to many others, it could be a very difficult thing. And, and it is difficult because people are not used to it yet. And we know that, you know, as a human being, we are very resistant to change. So I, many lawyers would want to go to the court, physical court, talk, go around, and now suddenly when they have to use the technology, the, uh, the phone, you know, the computer, they don't feel comfortable. So, so in order to help them to overcome those um, challenges, UNDP has been together with A2I, our, our flagship uh, project, uh, Access to um, Information, uh, or our second phase, we call it um, Aspire to Innovate. We have been very much um, trying to give very basic training to, to lawyers, to police, to anyone who is engaged in the virtual court implementation, to know how you can start with the process, how to start the bail application, how to up, uh, upload the document online. Same things are very simple, but it just needs to be uh, started and um, and people need to feel a little bit more comfortable. So only when you are doing it, then you feel that actually it's a very simple thing. But if you don't start, you feel that, oh my God, it's very complicated. So the training, I would say that is nothing special. It's just very simple use of the technology, how to uh, op uh, operate in this kind of virtual environment. We don't, I don't hear you. Apologies. Without uh, training, without effective training, this, can, this system cannot possibly work. So training is going to play a very critical role in us adapting to this system. Uh, thank you on behalf of the bar and the bench for being with us throughout this, uh, th these very difficult times. If I may now uh, pose my... We lost you again. Uh, so if I may now pose my next question to you, uh, what, what are the legal barriers that you had to overcome or you still have to overcome in order to uh, implement this system and scale up this system? If you could enlighten well, me on that. Okay. Before I answer that, could I just um, give you some background details? Indeed. Because as I see it, we in Bangladesh are way behind our neighbors and many of the other countries 
that we have be, uh, seen. Now, two things we have to keep in mind. Number one, that what we are talking about is, apart from the virtual course that we're having now because of COVID, it's an opportunity that's been given to us by a critical situation. Apart from that, what we have to think about is going forward. Do we keep the system for the betterment of our judiciary, for the judicial um, service delivery system? Now, we have to keep in mind that distinction between digitization and digitalization. Digitization is very simple. It's converting paper into digital form. So evidence, pleadings can be formed into, uh, converted into PDF digital forms. Digitalization is something different. It's the whole um, transformation of the manual process that we are now in the process of uh, used to doing to digital form using electronic means. Now, if I can, if you, if you will allow me, I would like Indeed. to go into some detail of the history behind my um, work in this area. So the idea of digital courts came to my mind in 2004 when I visited India as a newly appointed judge of the Supreme Court here in Bangladesh. And there I saw how the NIC was using IT in their court system. It was there, they were still in their infancy. And I brought back a huge bundle of papers to show to our then Chief Justice. Um, I couldn't sell the idea. It didn't work. Again, in around 2006, when I was on the company bench, there was a matter which was before me in my bench, which was at the same time, some uh, related matters were taking place in Singapore, as well as London. And I was astonished to see that the morning proceedings of the Singapore court were produced before me in the afternoon hearing in my court in transcript. And that was astonishing. And, you know, just like, I mean, I'm, uh, if you like, I'm a child at heart. And when, I, when you see a good thing in a shop, you know, you want to take your parents there and you want to buy it. And this <laughs> I, I wanted to get. I wanted the same to happen in my court. But it didn't happen. What happened then in 2008, I was shown again another visit to Malaysia. I was shown how they were digitizing their courts. Now, you know, people go out to various countries. They go see sightseeing and they go to the beach and do other things, shopping and so on. I don't. I go to see the courts, <laughs> see how they work, see how we can transform our situation. And then I brought again lots of paperwork to show our Chief Justice. Didn't work. My idea was not bought. In 2009, we started the electronic course list. Now, this was an idea. It was in the back of my mind. But for some reason, talking to my then neighbor, Justice Arnold Hawk, who was, who was in the next room to mine, he took it up. And he was basically the engineer behind our um, electronic course list, which we then started. He, he got, somehow got the permission of the then Chief Justice to do it. Um, it worked. And then, you know, we had the help of our IT team. We developed our own software in order to do that. In 2010, the to be Chief Justice took us to a, on a visit to Australia. There we saw how the Australian courts were. We came back, he became Chief Justice, and then sent us on a trip to Canada. Again, just to see how the e-judicial judiciary system works there. He was very much uh, eager to have this operation operational in our courts. We, with the help of UNDP at that time, started a project. I was even then uh, chairing the uh, Judicial Reforms Committee. Um, we started work in earnest. We even developed our own software to the extent that the clients could, from their village, find out the, the status of their case 
through the SMS from their mobile phones. But then, unfortunately, oh, things happen. Um, Which the, year was that? Sir? This was in 2010 and 2011. Regime changed. In fact, I might tell you that in 2011, a very high level delegation, including um, highly placed members of the bar, were sent on a trip to Philippines. And I, I, was, I was talking to the learned member of the bar only last week and asked him, did he learn anything from the trip in Philippines? And he said, yes, it's a very good system. And why can't we operate it here? Well, I think you all probably know the reason. I won't go into that. But then what happened was the regime in our court changed in 2011. And mm -hmm. momentum was lost. Again, the regime changed and brought back for fresh efforts from our part. I was again um, inducted into the chairmanship of the Reforms Committee. At that time, very small amount of money was left in the kitty. So with that money, we went on a trip to Silhet and we installed 15, maybe 20, I'm not sure exactly the number, of courts in Silhet where we installed the uh, computer and uh, monitors. And in this way, we were able to get the position of witnesses recorded by the court official as it took place, as it happened. So the witness could see what he had said. The lawyers could see what, the, what was said. The judge could see what was said. Anything that was wrongly stated could be corrected immediately. At the end of the day, the well, at the end of the testimony, the, the witness, the printout was taken, witness signed it, and it was all done. And this was all so transparent, and I'm told, much more quick than the uh, manual system that we're, we are used to. And we hope to replicate that throughout the country. But then what happened was, because we had no fund, because of the dwindling success of the pre previous project, UNDP did not get the support that they needed to function in, uh, more in, in the project. So again, the function of the Judicial Reforms Committee came back into the play. But I was a chairman of a, if you like, a defunct project, dead one with no money, so far as digitalization was concerned. But still, the ideas were simmering in my head. We had a backlog of three and a half million cases. We have more than that now. Hearings are delayed for years on end because of the backlog. And much of the delay, if I may say, could have been and could still be reduced by digitalizing the process of filing and strict adherence to court procedures, as given in this Court of Civil Procedure and Criminal Procedure. We could have e-filing, scanned documents could be filed in court, stand, digital records could be there, digital recordings of deposition, uh, as I said, admittedly speeded up the trial. Recording of deposition witnesses from outside the court, um, which require, of course, two-way video con conferencing. But you will find, if you look at the criminal cases, so many cases are delayed for years and years, simply because the investigating officer can't be traced, or if he is traced, he cannot come back to the court concerned to give evidence. On top of that, if we had the digital um, volumes of documents or uh, court files, it could be easily transferred from one court to the next, where now we have to wait for weeks, months, sometimes years for the court records to be transferred. The whole process could be automated in such a way, in such a way that files would not get lost. Um, the delay could be avoided. Sometimes we have intentional delay. Even that could be avoided because of the transparency of the situation. It all could, delay could be uh, avoided, and wherever, particularly where the next step is visible from the process within the record of the court. Now, there is always time, chance to improve all these situations. The future is bright if only we get support from the torchbearers who are now the young generation of lawyers, even the older generation. Now, you'll be surprised to hear 
some of the people who are now appearing before the high court virtually are people who said they can't even handle a, a mobile phone. But they are appearing virtually from their homes, people who are otherwise unable to move to the court. Now, this has only been made possible because of the situation of COVID and because of the fact that we have allowed the virtual hearings to take place. We had one case, if you remember, where a person appeared from some Howard Laka virtually and moved his case. Now, it made news, but I'm not concerned about news. What I'm concerned is that some litigant public has got the benefit of the system that we have put in place in this emerging situation. Now, the High Court of Delhi, you'll be surprised to hear, although I saw their IT work starting in 2004, in 2013, they started e-filing in the High Court of Delhi. And where are we now? 2020, we haven't started. And as I said, the delegate, high delegation, high level delegation that went to Philippines saw e-court operating in the Philippines in 2011. So we are still behind. And Philippines is not that far ahead of us. In fact, if at all, I don't think it is ahead of us in development terms. So the unfortunate thing is that anything technical in nature is anathema. We don't touch it because we are used to what we have and we are quite happy with what we have. But then just think of the benefits that we could get by utilizing IT and uh, technology. Um, we have to learn to use technology. Innovations happening. I mean, should we go back to the quill pen and ink? I mean, this, was, this is what happened in a recent judgment in, I mean, other people also object in, in Canada. Um, I have a copy of the judgment here where one judge, his name was F.L. Myers of the Ontario Superior Court. He said, um, in my view, the simplest answer to the issue, the issue of objections raised, raised by lawyers, is that it is 2020. In other words, we are in 2020. We no longer record evidence using a quill pen and ink. So if we talk about tradition, you want to go back to tradition, let's go back to using the quill pen. The pen made out of reed. So shall we go back to that? We now have, to, he said, we now have technology, technological ability to communicate remotely effectively. We all use the phones to talk to people in America, Australia, and wherever else they might be. Using it is more efficient and far less costly than personal attendance. We should not be going back. So my question is, should we not adopt the technology? And keeping in mind that everybody's in the same boat, all lawyers are in the same boat. Yes, some are more tech savvy than others, but it doesn't take that much to get into this scheme of things. As I said, old generation lawyers have been able to appear in the virtual courts and got relief from them. Now, the problem with the... Um, the, the barriers. Courts, the, the, the difficulties that the barriers that you talk about. Yes. Um, physical presence, so far as physical presence is a necessity of physical presence, that I would suggest has been uh, catered for by the ordinance itself. If I can just place before you the um, section four of the ordinance, uh, it says, Bharat in Onujai, Kunu Vektir Virtual Upositi Nishit Korahuile, Devani Karjubidi, Ba Fosdari Karjubidi. So his virtual presence will be deemed to fulfill the requirement of his physical presence in court. Yes, there are certain numbers of um, sections in the CPC and CRPC where physical presence is called for. But if the ordinance says that physical presence by virtual presence is satisfied, then that's the end of the matter. No physical presence is necessary. And, you know, think of it like this. When uh, you want the accused to appear in court physically, why? This is right. This is right to see the proceedings. This is right to see the witness giving evidence against him. But then if he is away some other place in, in another room or in another house or in another building, 
he can see the court proceeding in, in the video. He can see what people are saying, who's talking. He can see how the judge is behaving. He can see everything. And equally, the court can see the demeanor of a witness. It is said, you know, that the, the law requires the demeanor to be noted down in the, uh, in the records of the court, court proceedings. Yes, it, is, it can be written down. The demeanor can be observed. It's said, I think, in that judgment, uh, the Canadian judgment, that I find it better to look at the witness uh, when he is on, sitting in front of me on my video screen than sitting away from me, uh, 12 meters away, uh, in a witness box. Because I see him better and closer. So, you know, these things are there and you have to keep it in mind. Now, there are some difficulties in law because of the fact that the Evidence Act needs to be changed with regard to um, uh, electronic evidence. Now, that, I understand, is in the pipeline. And without that, trials would be difficult to continue, um, particularly criminal trials and civil trials, where evidence is required, where signatures need to be proved. Now, it can all be done by amendment of the law. As you know, the IT Act has a provision where you know it talks about signatures, electronic signatures, the ability to accept electronic signatures. Now, these are things um, that can be solved. Now, one question that has arisen about public hearing and open court. Now, these are issues that, again, can be resolved easily um, by allowing the recordings of the proceedings to be put on public media. Uh, this, is, this is how the UK courts uh, actually did, dealt with that. Um, for today's webinar, you can put it on YouTube and everybody can see it. I mean, court proceedings are public, yes. And the webinar, the court proceedings in a, in a virtual hearing, that can also be put onto the uh, you know, uh, media and that can be seen by everybody. It is not as if any public person or even any media person appearing in a courtroom can ask questions. They can't. They can't take part in the proceedings. So just observation of the, what happened in the proceedings, that can be really solved by just putting the recording onto the media and uh, let them see it. Now, we have other problems. The problems that we have particularly uh, are lacking infrastructure. We don't have proper and continuous uh, internet facilities. We don't have, we can't even guarantee uh, continuous electricity supply. Um, IT equipment is lacking. Software is not yet up to the mark. Um, manpower, training, as uh, uh, Van has said, training of lawyers is absolutely essential. Training of judges is absolutely essential. These are new things that are coming in front of us. And yes, unless we are told how to use them, taught how to use them, um, it will be difficult. But it is not so difficult that it can't be used at all. If it was so difficult and impossible to use, then nobody would be using it. And I don't think we are any worse off than the person next door neighbor. I mean, uh, the thing that I quote very often uh, whenever I hear people talking in a negative way is that there, is, there was a video, and I think most people have seen it, um, from a district court in Bakura. Now, Bakura is a place about the uh, same distance as Joshua is from Dhaka, as Bakura is from Kolkata. Now, the district court in Bakura, the district judge in Bakura, and the lawyers in Bakura can have virtual hearings by, with their laptops. Why can't our lawyers do the same? I don't see the difficulty. Yes, maybe you need some training. Maybe we all need some training. Um, I had to learn how to use the uh, Teams uh, software, and I now know how to operate it because somebody, I think, um, had a webinar, uh, and uh, I took part in that incognito, and I learned how to use it. Now, I would ask the learned advocates to consider what the beneficial uh, aspects are of these digitalized courts. Benefits to the litigants. Um, my relative was technically challenged, but he managed to move the court and get relief for his clients, and I think it's equally possible for anyone. Now look at the positive side. We're trying to improve and demonstrate our success demonstrates that it is possible. The Supreme Court has shown the willingness to enhance the justice delivery system. That is what we have done. We have proven that this can be done. 33,000, probably by now 40 plus thousands of applications have been dealt with. Thousands of applications have been dealt with by the High Court Division, by the few judges that are there. Now, I make no apology for my persistence in trying to make the system work better and faster and cheaper. 
a more transparent way. I would simply say that I do everything in my power for the enhancement of the rule of law, for the betterment of our service delivery system. Of course, much more work needs to be done um, in the short term as well as in the long term. And I can only say that with the cooperation of the bar, other stakeholders, the justice delivery system can be improved significantly, thus ensuring the people have their human rights ensured and their rule of law ensured. Now, I cannot thank the UNDP enough for their help. In the past, from the year 2010, I think, when I first uh, came into contact with them, until now. Um, I will say a little bit more after you know, Gwen has told us how she's going <laughs> to help us in the future. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, Miss Quinn, uh, if I may um, ask you about uh, the issue raised by uh, Mr. Justice Imam Musa about public access to these uh, trials that will now be taking place, because uh, the public has to have free and fair access to court proceedings. Currently, as the virtual courts are operating, it's only the participants uh, who have access to this, the lawyer, the judge, and probably a court official. But how do we um, ensure live streaming of court proceedings? Uh, sir was talking about um, after the matter is done, we can post it or upload it uh, on YouTube and thus ensuring access afterwards. But what about live streaming? Is that at all possible? Or does UNDP have that in the pipeline? Okay, so thank you so much for that um, question. But before I answer that question, I would like to say something. Sure. I think that virtual court has so much benefits, and you have already been listening to um, to Justice Iman Ali. One thing he didn't mention it, but maybe because I am a person who is new to the country, something maybe you are born with or you didn't see it, is that by having the virtual court, you, yes, you reduce the cost for people, but you also have the environment. Just imagine that you all have to go to the court, two hours on the street, you know, on the road, and getting mm -hmm. stuck, traffic. So those things actually, by not having to go, it helps you, it saves time, it saves money, and it saves environment. So this is something that I see it very clearly um, as a, a, one of the very uh, prominent benefits of the, of the virtual court. And of course, you know, um, there are, as, um, as a justice has been saying about uh, how much we have been able to do in Bangladesh, and it compares to other, to other countries. We know that, you know, since COVID, there are just so many countries have started using virtual courts. Of course, you have India, you have the Philippines, you have Malaysia, but out, you know, like the UK, like Argentina, Brazil, US. But if you look, if you, if you, if you just Google to see, you will see that they also have been facing the similar or the same problems as we are facing here in Bangladesh. So we, they also have problems with internet connection. They also have problems with power being cut. They also have problems with some uh, technological, you know, shortcoming or it's not happening at the right time, at the right place. So things are, are, are not only um, unique to Bangladesh. We have been do, able to do so much. We can keep doing it. We know that it's not perfect, but we know also know that we cannot at this time cannot let the best to be the enemy of the good. So we have to do what we haven't been able to do. And along the way, we are learning, we are fixing the problem, we are overcoming obstacles. And obstacles are, are all there, you know. So going to your question about how can we, and of course we also have, uh, people are complaining about, you know, the access, people are also complaining about if the benefit or if the objective of virtual court is to 
to avoid people from being exposed to COVID-19. However, you know, the just can be virtually, but the lawyers and other litigants, they may still have to go because the process as of now, the virtual court is not, the ordinance is not the only thing that we have to fix. We have it, but we have to fix so many other things. Law or different, different rules and procedures require you to also to change in order to support the ordinance. So, and those things take time. We only ask people to please be patient with us, be patient with the Supreme Court. So we are fixing things or problems as we go along. The, the system right now is both manual and digital. But we will try to be to come forward to digitalization as a Justice um, Iman Ali has been saying. So, yes, you can always decide to look at this problem as a half full glass or half empty glass. I would very much hope and urge people to please look at the virtual court as a half full glass. So now looking at, uh, talking about the, the access, virtual court, yes, as of now, when you are going through the virtual court, you are, in Bangladesh, we use uh, Microsoft Team. Other countries, they use Zoom, they use other technology, they use other means. And those are quite uh, limited to those people who are part of that hearing. But as, we said that those hearing could be made available to public. And our project A2I has been helping the government on digital Bangladesh. So I fully believe, and I am very confident that that would be one of the areas that UNDP will be very much looking forward to work with the just, uh, with, with, with Supreme Court to see how we can input uh, operationalize it, make it available to the people so that the hearing become accessible to everyone. Now, but don't forget, even if we have the hearing at the physical court, mm -hmm. not everyone is accessible. Just imagine, if a woman, if a poor woman in Chittagong Hill tribe, how can she go to the court, you know, even though she wants to, but if she goes she needs somebody, a male maybe accompany her. That male accompany her cannot go because if he goes, then he lose one day of working. And their wage, they are daily laborer. So all those things, or somebody with disability, how can they go? And because we know that here, it's not all the building are friendly to people with disability. So actually, if you look at virtual court, virtual God would be better in that sense. So what I'm saying is that we will do our best to make the hearing accessible to the public. At the same time, we have to acknowledge and recognize that even with the physical court, it's not accessible to everyone. And that's something that UNDP together with the government, we try our best to justify, to address those problems when the time has come, the post-COVID that we all go back to to the physical court and that we would would want to make sure that justice, access to justice is available to all. Thank you very much, uh, Van. Uh, we're actually very reassured and relieved to know that the issues that concern us are being addressed and they're very much on your list of priorities as well. Um, uh, Mr. Justice Imanali, sir, uh, As, as you've mentioned and Van has mentioned as well, that a lot has to be changed in order to um, roll this out and scale this up in terms of amending rules, regulations, laws. Uh, so the practice directions that have been issued uh, for the High Court as well as the Appellate Division uh, raised a number of questions. And one of the questions which was all, almost on everyone's mind was that there was no definition of urgency and uh, this 
they ought there should be a, an objective criteria laid down as to what matters are urgent and what matters are not urgent in this regard sir if i may just uh, to uh, emphasize the point share the indian experience uh very recently a uh, famous uh, media personality arnav goswami filed uh, a case in the indian supreme court and if i may quickly read out from the news report at 8 pm on 23rd april arnav goswami the editor and owner of republic tv moved a petition in the supreme court demanding an urgent hearing to quash multiple firs filed against him by congress leaders in various states the supreme court registry scrutinized goswami's petition listed it for hearing 10:30 the next morning this raised eyebrow advocate uh, repak kansal whose matter was about supply of rations to stranded migrant workers during the lockdown had to wait for 11 days to have his matter heard by uh, the court whereas goswami's case was listed for hearing the very next day through a supplementary list uh so he filed a complaint alleging discrimination and demanding corrective steps against the pick and choose policy adopted so, so just to share the indian experience that without a clear definition of what urgency is uh we could end up in a place like this so so we would love yes. to hear your guidelines on that matter well i think simply said it all depends on the discretion of the judge because how can you or anyone objectively define urgency anyone moving a case for his client that is for him the most urgent thing in the world because his client is pressing him from behind his client client is probably paying more than he ought to to get his case heard earlier and quicker and you will always find that the judge who makes a decision exercising discretion will be criticized for not exercising it differently but i think it would be dangerous situation if anyone was to question the discretion exercise of discretion by any judge it is his prerogative for example you take the case of a bail bail is not as a matter of right for anyone other than in a bailable case so if the judge considers all the circumstances surrounding the case all the evidence and materials before him and allows bail then everybody is happy but if having considered all the evidence and material before him he does not allow the bail somebody is unhappy but then you cannot take away from the judge his discretion to allow or not to allow bail there is of course the higher authority from the high court division you can go up to the appellate division from the lower court if from the magistrate you can go to the district judge from the district judge you come to the high court so there are always checks and balances but then discretion cannot be interfered with discretion has to be exercised when I mean, you talk about you know you've learned about the chancellor's foot and equity equity is as long as it's as, as long as the chancellor's foot so one person's equity may not be the same as the another person's equity one person's urgency may not will not be the same as another person's urgency so i think at the end of the day we have to leave it to the discretion of the judge and i don't think there is any objection or objective measure of what is urgent because criteria it all it all depend on the person concerned everyone has his priorities and my case is always of course more prioritized has to be prioritized before anybody else's so uh, on that note just to uh, get a little bit uh, uh, clear the confusion that exists in the bar is uh, how do i know if my case is urgent or not in the sense a little more guidance perhaps as to what would be urgent may be helpful of course the discretion is very much there but uh, maybe guidelines for the members of the bar so that i know how if i can make out a case of urgency or not without having to go through the motion of uploading everything and um, then finding out that my matter is not urgent enough 
uh, that was a concern that was raised. And so certain cases, probably it's, it's fairly clear if it's urgent or not, like the Indian case that I highlighted. On one hand, we had a media personality who's known to have a political affiliation. He had ca cases were filed by the other political party. Was that more urgent or was supply of rations to stranded migrant workers during lockdown more urgent? So there, I guess uh, that is a case where it's fairly clear uh, what is urgent and what is not. So even if as basic as that, guidelines would be very helpful for members of the bar. Because uh, this issue guidelines, right? guidelines from the Supreme Court, issuing guidelines from the Supreme Court binds the discretion of the judge. And I don't think that is that would be proper. That would be. We a have to allow the judge to make his decision based on his perception of the urgency so, as portrayed by the lawyer on behalf of his client. And I don't think we could fetter that. That would not be right to do that. Because then we are standing on the foot of the learned judge. We don't want to do that. Which we don't want to do at all, sir. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, so uh, I, this question I would pose to both of you about scaling up virtual courts. And uh, what sort of a time, because COVID-19 is here to stay, at least up until a vaccine uh, becomes available. So I guess we need to scale up uh, as fast as possible. So how, what do you, how, where do you see us going? How, how much time do you think scaling up might take? And what sort of steps has UNDP taken so far or going to take in the future? So if I, if may, I may answer start. that, indeed. Yes, um, we are working in the background, as I say, nonstop. We have, I must say, <clears throat> paucity of resources. Even, even UNDP, with all their help and all their goodwill, they are still constrained by the amount of resources that is available to them. We have talked to various ministries to help us out. The process that we are trying to develop for it to be working through the whole of the spectrum of judiciary, it is very expensive. It is very resource consuming and it cannot be done overnight. The process of developing software to cater for all the 1800 or so judges that we have it is very difficult. It's not possible to do it overnight. And this, whatever we have done over the last period of few weeks, it's extraordinary because of the extraordinary situation. You cannot ex expect that to happen overnight for the whole of the judiciary. It can't, simply cannot happen. In fact, if I remember, we had a project, the A to I, the E Judiciary Project, which uh, I started uh, possibly in 2015 and 16. I left it for other reasons, which I will not go into right now. But that was planned for five years. So if we start today for the e-judiciary project, it can take anything up to five years to complete it. So nothing will happen overnight. What we have done is extraordinary. We have done it in a very short space of time with hard work from a lot of people. But that cannot be expected for the whole of the judiciary. And if what you're asking is, can we, all the judiciary, all the cases, all the trials, can they all take place tomorrow? The answer is no. No. It'll take a lot of work. It'll take a lot of resources. Even today, we are short of uh, space on the server. We cannot cope. Only with 11 judges of the High Court Division operating, only with uh, probably uh, four, five, 600 judges in the uh, lower judiciary working on our pre present scheme. So you can imagine if we are to upscale that to 100 judges of the Supreme Court and 1,500 or 18, 1,600 judges of the uh, lower judiciary, can't be done over, overnight. It cannot, cannot be done over, even over weeks and months. But certainly, if we have the goal ahead of us, if we know where the goal is, if we have our aims straight, we can do it. It can be done but it has to be done slowly. 
Indeed, sir. And we have been making progress because we already see scaling up in stages. So we are yes. very hopeful that this will continue. Uh, if I may now ask my uh, related question uh, to Ms. Yuan about scaling up. Uh, what is UNDP's vision so far as scaling up is concerned? Is there a timeline? Okay, so um, UNDP alone, as I said earlier, will not be able to do much. Um, but given the COVID-19 and the, and the fact that we need to move so fast, we were actually able to work with the um, Supreme Court for, the, for what we call the immediate phase, which started in April and we finished in around July. So those are three months, and we were able to achieve a lot as a, as a justice, Iman Ali has said. Now, the next phase would be, um, uh, because we have also learned quite a lot of lessons, we see the challenges ahead, and we also have a vision. We have a goal uh, that we would like to um, move, advance um, ahead it's not only on virtual court because as a uh, as a as a justice uh, Iman Ali said, when COVID is behind us, virtual court is not there anymore. But somehow a semi virtual court or a digital or e justice systems will be in place, and that takes a long way to go. And we are committed as UNDP to working together with the government and also with the uh, Supreme Court to start our conversation to see what would be our future. What would be the vision of the government? What would be the plan of the Supreme Court? And we, will be, we are committed to working with you, come up with a good plan so that we can ensure that access to justice is sustainable to all. And UNDP will be, will be advocating this need with other donors, with other de development partners. It's not only donors, it can also be private sector. You know, those, for example, when we work, up, uh, when we try to develop those software, those can be done, you know, together in collaboration with private sector. So those, all those avenues will be ex we will be exploring together with um, Supreme Court. I cannot give you a, 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 a concrete answer right now. What I can say is that we are together. We are in it together. And we would like to make, to, to, to make sure that what we have been able to achieve is not going to lose. But it will be a momentum for us to move on and to move for a better future for the justice of Bangladesh. Um, so, so um, that would be that would be what, uh, our uh, our plan for UNDP. And of course, we uh, we enjoy and we appreciate the partnership with the with the Supreme Court, um, and we will be always there to support. Thank you. Scaling up is in the yeah, scaling up is in the plan. And scaling up to very much in the plan. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ms. Nguyen. I think uh, so, uh, so can you hear us? I can hear you, but I didn't hear any of what Fran said. Uh, if I may summarize, uh, Ms. Nguyen said that we're all in this together. It's going to take time. It will be difficult to give a, an exact timeline, as uh, you have stated, sir. But uh, collaboration is called for amongst all the key stakeholders, including the private sector, uh, so far as IT infrastructure is concerned. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ms. Nguyen. That more or less sums up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sir, if I may ask you um, about um, uh, scaling up is going to take a bit of time, uh, a lot of time, in fact. 
So uh, the judiciary will not be functioning at full capacity. Given that, uh, they can't we explore ways to gainfully utilize this time? I mean, one way that I could think of of the top was to um, utilize this time to deliver judgments which have matters pending only for judgment. All other stages are complete since uh, the judiciary will have free capacity at this point. So wanted to hear your thoughts on that matter, sir. Yes, I think there are many non-contentious matters which could be dealt with. But as I said at the very outset, this whole jurisdiction is with the Honorable Chief Justice. He will have to decide how much to open the court, if at all to open the court, or if some of the work that we have been doing uh, can be done virtually. And I think I agree with you to the extent that if, for example, arguments have been heard in a particular case, um, then it doesn't take anything more than just simply for the two judges to be virtually in front of the two lawyers um, and to just deliver the judgment. Um, the question, I suppose, arises whether or not they will have to have recourse to their files and records. Um, now, you may know, we have seen from uh, experience that sometimes this, this virus is apparently transmitted through pa papers. So mm -hmm. we don't want to put anybody to risk. Um, if it could be possible for the judges to deliver their judgments without the recourse to have any uh, recourse to any papers and so on, uh, documents and uh, court files, it could be done. But how far that is realistic, I don't know. And uh, I suppose it must be up to the Honorable Chief Justice to decide what cases, if any, can uh, be heard or can take place. I think if, if COVID goes on and if the lockdown is to be extended, perhaps we will have to rethink on uh, hearing some matters, at least matters which can be dealt with more easily uh, virtually rather than uh, physical presence in the court. Yes, it can be thought about. Um, I can't decide it. Uh, we can only talk about it, and then Honorable Chief Justice will decide it. Indeed. So, and um, our uh, last question of the day, uh, To uh, I'll start with Ms. Nguyen. Um, do you, you have actually partially answered this question already, but I'll still pose it for the benefit of the viewers. Uh, do you see this as just a temporary stopgap measure or do you see virtual courts becoming part of the justice delivery system? I'm not saying replacing it, but at least a part of it uh, in any manner in Bangladesh. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I believe that um, virtual court is... So much needed during this time. And just imagine if we don't have it right now, how many people are actually suffering from lack of access to justice? And we all know justice delay is justice denied. And access to justice is a fundamental human right. So therefore, what we have been able to achieve we have to continue, and I believe that it is not a stopgap. It is a very good move in the very right direction. After COVID, when things become back to the normal, maybe the 100% the, the virtual may not be the best option for us, but some elements of virtual cost will continue as a digitalization, you know, how there are cases that we don't really need to go to the court physically. And if that's the case, why don't we have to go to the court? You know, we can actually settle those cases, have those hearings virtually. But I would agree with uh, uh, Justice uh, Iman Ali when he was saying that it's a, a semi-virtual court would be, um, would be the, the option for the future. So, what we have been able to achieve as the government of Bangladesh, you have actually done a very good job as uh, the um, duty bearer towards the right holder. 
and the right holders are also poor, the, the ordinary citizens of Bangladesh. So I just would like to say congratulations to the government, to the Supreme Court, and to everyone who's behind this wonderful initiative, or as we all say, this is a, a groundbreaking. So I would not want to, to believe that a stopgap, that it will go away after COVID. I actually believe that some part of this are quite positive and should be transforming into a different form. But whatever form we are going to do or to, to make it happen, it all for the benefit of the people those who need access to justice. Thank you very much, Ms. Huen. Uh, sir, if I may uh, pose the same question to you, uh, you've already addressed this partly in your uh, earlier address to the webinar, but do you see this, uh, realistically speaking, become an integral part of the system, even if in a limited way, maybe for some special types of sensitive matters? As I said earlier, Fully virtual courts will not be necessary after this emerging situation disappears. But what will remain, I mean, virtual court will be probably useful, for example, in um, uh, online dispute resolution, ADR, and other such processes, particularly international ADR, where expense and time and movement would be necessary for persons dealing with the hearings. So apart from those- so What about first, sexual offenses? Well, cases. even in, the, in that case, you don't need a virtual, fully virtual court. You need semi-virtual court in the sense that the person who need not appear in court can appear from elsewhere. You don't have to hide the judge. You hide the witness. You hide the accused. Even now, our law, our um, and Children Act allows people to give evidence from a distance, from a remote place. So only to that extent, you will have virtual hearings. And particularly more useful will be the uh, effect if you have uh, the ability to uh, um, examine witnesses who are abroad, uh, for expert witnesses, for example who are no longer available in the city where the trial is taking place. So this type of thing can take place. What is more important, I think, is for us to have what, is, what I would say a digital court. A court fully digitalized in the sense that the proceedings take place um, with digitalized uh, um, papers so that you don't need whole bundles of documents in front of you. You can simply press a button on the, on the laptop to see what the document says. Equally, the lawyers will be in the same position. They will, need, they will not need to uh, flip through pages and pages of um, physical papers. We will save the trees also by avoiding papers. Now, that can only happen if we go ahead and have the virtual, uh, the digitalized court system. That will only happen if we allow the e-filing to take place. So. Even there, you will have your original documents. And even during the COVID, I, I heard one barrister talking uh, of how they deal with the uh, court hearings. And he said that everything is filed uh, electronically. But in spite of that, if any judge should require to see the original documentation, he'll ask for the original record. That will be sent to him. He'll keep it aside for three days and then handle it so that the virus doesn't spread uh, in his courtroom or in his place of wherever he may be. So these are precautions that are being taken. If we have the e-filing system, we will not need to be handling papers. But that is not to say that we will, not, we will never have access to original papers. If necessary, we will look to the original papers. We will look to the original documentation. But if it is not necessary, if it is not in doubt, if there is no a uh, question from the other side about the um, the authenticity of any document, then you don't have to see the original papers. Paper, the e-paper in front of you, that should be sufficient. But what what I must say is that we must continue to our uh, to work towards digitalizing our courts so that we can use electronic methods 
in order to speed up the trials, because that is where that is the only way we're going to be able to at least keep up with the backlog of cases that we have we are facing. Three and a half million and more cases now in the backlogs. That is a lot of cases. It will take hundreds of years to get through those if we go at the pace that we are going at now. Indeed, indeed, sir. So, uh, a, a comment from Mr. Justice Sayed Rifat Ahmed. Uh, so, uh, if you would kindly address this. He suggests that we could strike a balance that is uh, courts can continue to function and remain open to the public without the need for participants to attend in person. So if you could... Um, how do you, if you open the courts, how do you prevent any person coming? By police? By force? To what extent do you apply force in order to prevent people rushing into the courtrooms? into the sections where our, our staff are working. Mm -hmm. These are, I think, at the moment, I would say these things are impractical, keeping in mind the health concerns, the concerns of the safety and life of our workers, of indeed the mm -hmm. judges and the lawyers. Public perhaps, perhaps do not appreciate the, the depth of the problem. Whenever they get the chance, they rush. You've seen how they rushed on, on the eve occasions, crowded the uh, launches and the buses and the trains, mm -hmm. whatever was available. And when they, they were not available, they literally walked in droves. Now, that didn't help the situation any. I, as a result of that, we have now very high rate of um, infection rate. coronavirus infection and highest, uh, you know, record rates of deaths. Indeed. So we encourage that. I don't think we should encourage that. The ground reality is such that that would be very impossible to pull off without the infection rates going up and soaring. And who will take the responsibility? Indeed. You know, of any death that happened. I mean, if should we open the court and if should, should any one of our peons contract the virus, who is he going to blame? Indeed, sir. Not just his Indeed. luck, I tell you. You will not just blame his luck. You blame the institution. Indeed. His family would blame the institution. He may not be there to blame us. Indeed, sir. So I think these are things, it's very um, you know, sensitive issues. Issues. And they have to be, they have to be dealt with sensitively. Uh, so thank goodness I'm not there to make the decision. <laughs> I, would, I would hate to be in that position. So very difficult choices to make at all levels, uh, at all levels. Uh, so which takes me to the next leg of Mr. Justice Ayad Rifat Ahmed's comment, which was on uh, the mode of intervention adopted in the UK, which you've also mentioned earlier, the UK Coronavirus Act 2020. Uh, so instead of uh, having to amend uh, each law individually to make virtual courts possible and to remove all barriers. Uh, what about having one overarching act, wh which is time bound, as has been done in the UK? This is an enabling legislation with a lifespan of two years. Uh, I mean, there is still time given that the ordinance that has been promulgated has not yet been passed in Parliament and hasn't turned into an act yet. So is there time to make this more comprehensive? And instead of having to individually change laws, have one overarching law with a lifespan of two years or three years? Well, the, as I said at the very beginning, the ordinance, in fact, does away with the necessity of physical presence, as mentioned in the uh, uh, CPC and the CRPC. So Indeed. those two laws need not be amended at all. And it says any other law. So any other law which calls for physical presence has been dealt with. So the only law that now needs to be um, thought about is the Evidence Act. And that, as I said, I don't think that can be so easily done because in the Evidence Act you will see so many sections, different sections relate to evidence and the quality of evidence, the quality, particularly the accessibility, the admissibility of evidence taken electronically and mm -hmm. the corollary situation where, you know, you have um, expert witnesses with regard to electronic evidence. So all these has to be changed. 
There's a lot of changes will be necessary in the evidence side. And I believe that is in the pipeline. How long that will take, I don't know. But once that is done, I think we, are, we would be in the clear. We would not need to change any other law. Indeed, sir. Um, uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Quinn. We have come to the end of our webinar. Uh, our deep gratitude to both of you for such an illuminating discussion on the why and how of virtual courts in Bangladesh. Um, and we came to know for the first time that the idea was actually conceived over a decade back in Mr. Justice Iman Ali sir's mind as uh, during his travels to different jurisdictions where he came across how virtual courts or electronically the judiciary could operate. Uh, we're grateful for that. Uh, we're grateful for that moment uh, when this idea was first conceived. Um, there is hardly anything that I can add to the illuminating discussion that we've already had, except to perhaps try and summarize. And it, what are the points that we can take away from this? Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Can I interrupt you for a second? Can Indeed, sir. Just for one second. I mean, sure. I, I just want to finish. I mean, you know, in every speech, you, you finish up with a quotation from some uh, Greek literature or something like that. Indeed, sir. I want to, I want to just add to uh, whatever I have said to one quotation that I recently came across in a book by Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And he was advised by his father, Sheikh Lutfur Rahman. And I quote, his father advised him. He said, sincerity of purpose and honesty of purpose. Takle jibone porajito havana. And that was the advice given to Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman by his father. And I must say that I have always believed, and that is why I persevere in my attempts to get digital course in Bangladesh. So we are and I hope deeply grateful you will for this. Support. Indeed, sir, we're deeply grateful. This has been extremely inspiring for all members of the bar who have been waiting to hear from Mr. Justice Iman Ali, sir about this journey of virtual courts in Bangladesh and about future prospects. And um, the quotation, sir, that you just referred to, I think that will inspire all of us in persevering. Uh, and uh, with that, if I may now make a humble attempt to summarize the key findings, the takeaways from this webinar. Uh, the first finding to start with was that it's, uh, given the raging COVID-19 pandemic, we had no options but to start virtual operations at the court. And this was necessary. This is a temporary measure, but this may eventually become an integral part of the justice delivery system, even if in a limited capacity. The second takeaway from uh, this webinar was that there are legal, infrastructural, and uh, practical barriers, which we have to continuously, continually address to improve the system. One of the legal barriers, as Mr. Justice Iman Ali sir said, it's the Evidence Act that may that will require amendment at some point uh, when it comes to electronic evidence. And uh, the third takeaway from this webinar is virtual operation uh, poses a steep learning curve for the bar and the bench. Uh, these are extraordinary circumstances and there are we have no option but to adapt to these circumstances and train ourselves UNDP has been providing invaluable training sessions so I urge all members of the bar to take use to use these training sessions to equip themselves and the last takeaway definitely not the least is um, this is more of a reassurance which, which, which Mr. Justice Iman Ali sir has given the bar that this is not intended to replace this um, 100, 200 year old system that we are all used to, but rather make the system more efficient by being a part of this system. We're going to use information technology to our benefit to make the mode of justice delivery more efficient. Uh, so we're not taking away any traditional traditions or we're not destroying heritage or anything of the sort just making justice more accessible to everyone and more efficient uh, with that um, needless to say this is a journey that will be fraught with 
many, many difficulties. And the bar and the bench, UNDP and A2I has to work in this together. Collaboration is the only way to deal with the pandemic. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you very much, sir, once again for gracing this webinar. Thank you, thank Ms. You very much. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. thank you very much. Yes. So viewers, please stay with us for the next webinar of ALAP. We will be announcing the topic very soon, and hopefully it will be as relevant as today. Um, thank you once again. Hope you learned from it and benefited from it. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Thank you.